Hey everybody, Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com, back with some Pittsburgh Steelers analysis. We are full swing into their 2021 Steelers training camp. We have been at the last four practices, all the ones open to the public and all the pad practices. And so I wanted to kind of give a recap and impression of the first four days, the last four days that we've observed so far with the team having an off day on Sunday. They'll be back at Heinz Field on Monday and Tuesday before playing their first preseason game, the Hall of Fame game, on Thursday against the Dallas Cowboys. While I talk through the positions group by group, I want to throw up some photos that were taken by our Tim Rice. He's done a great job, so be sure to shout him out if you see him on Twitter or if you see him at Heinz Field, he might return for a couple more practices this camp, but uh, some really good shots that are definitely a big help for us at Steelers Depot. Let's start things, though, with the quarterback position. With quarterback, obviously Ben is the starter. He's still on his old practice schedule of full day, half day, off day. So um, hasn't been a whole lot to report. Hasn't always practiced every single day. Missed the Friday Night Lights practice just with routine and rest. And that's all well and good. Obviously the focus on camp really isn't too much on him, especially being a full year removed from that elbow surgery. And the focus has really been on the backups with Mason Rudolph, Dwayne Haskins, and Josh Dobbs. I'll put up the uh, training camp stats that we tabulate and, 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 and cover throughout practice just to kind of show the numbers. The numbers can be a bit deceiving sometimes. It's context. It's important. But obviously, you look at the numbers, and I think a couple things are pretty striking. Dwayne Haskins, much better numbers than Rudolph or Josh Dobbs. Rudolph's uh, yards per attempt. His numbers are pretty low overall. A lot of checkdowns, a lot of short throws. Two minute drills have not been as efficient as they needed to be in the first two-minute drill that he ran a couple days ago. Never got the ball into the end zone. They couldn't score, ran out of time. For Haskins, he led his team down field for a touchdown, although it was a blown coverage by the Steelers' defense, um, and so it was kind of a wide-open throw. But still, you know, Haskins scored, and, and Rudolph did not. I think just overall, it's kind of reflective in their play. Haskins has found that balance between being aggressive, pushing the ball downfield, but not forcing a lot of throws. They did have a bad interception in seven shots on uh, Saturday to James Pierre, but other than that, has not really had a lot of you know bad or risky or just kind of poor decisions. And obviously, some issues he had in Washington were that decision making. And so I think he's kind of finding that balance between Rudolph, who's pretty risk adverse, and Josh Dobb, who's probably taking on too much risk. And al- although he only has one interception, could have, could have three or four because he's really made some you know, dangerous type throws that have nearly been picked off. And so I think Haskins has definitely looked the best of those quarterbacks so far. The caveat is, is that I'm sure Dwayne Haskins has always looked good in practice because his physical skill set is, is legit. That arm is, is really live. And so how that looks inside of a stadium, even preseason action is going to be, I think the big test for him. A lot of quarterbacks are going to look good in settings where they can't be touched, can't get hit. The pressure won't phase them. And you're going against the defense where, you know, all those guys, you know, their defense, you've repped against them, you know, every single day since the spring. Um, during practice and OTAs and things like that. But Haskins, I think, has been sharp. And so, you know, before camp, I was pretty dismissive of the idea that that Haskins could push for that number two job. It was about him just, you know, making the team, uh, battling Josh Dobbs and getting that number three spot. But is that door cracked open to, to beat Rudolph? Yeah, I think it's it's at least open. It's possible. Well, we can entertain and discuss the idea. Haskins will have to play well in the preseason and in, in, in game action, and Rudolph will have to struggle but is it impossible that Haskins could be the number two? I don't think so, as we sit here today. Let's move on to running backs, and that's obviously a really interesting group. A lot of questions, a lot of youth there, and guys that have a, a lot to prove. Najee Harris, I think, overall has been as advertised. He's taken his lumps occasionally with some you know, bad reps and backs on backers, a fumble occasionally, a couple drops during Saturday's practice. But overall, I think he's been you know, being able to create. He's been competitive. He showed his strength and his receiving ability overall. So he's the same guy that we studied coming out of Alabama, and he's, he's competitive, and he wants those reps, and they've given him quite a bit of reps as well, whether that is a drill like backs on backers or, you know, carries, leads the team with 18 carries right now um, overall. So he showed power from the very first carry he had in practice in pads. He had a 15-yard run, dragon defenders. Um, he's been, I think, every bit the guy that they, the Steelers hoped they were getting when they made him the 24th pick of this draft. It's looking like his backup this year will be Anthony McFarland, and I think there'll be times where you'll see both Harris and McFarland on the field in that pony set. And I know we talk about pony set seemingly every single offseason, and it never ends up happening and translating to regular season action, but I think McFarland is going to be one of the biggest benefactors of this Mac Gannett offense. And of course, those two guys were together in Maryland back in 2018 when McFarland had a, a really strong year for the Terps, averaging seven yards per carry. And so you'll see a lot of 
times where he's split out, you know, in the slot right or slot left, and then motion across on jet action and either take the handoff or fake it as window dressing or, you know, can be used in a variety of different ways. So I think McFarland's going to be the backup and at times be on the field with Najee Harris. Kalen Balazs, to me, has a lot of backup value where he's not going to be a starter caliber player because he's not super explosive and just hasn't had the, the success, you know, based on his his stats so far where he's averaging you know, what career what three and a half yards per carry whatever that number is but i mean this guy's got good size he can block he can catch and he looked he's been the best guy in backs on backers the two times they've run it um he, you know he hasn't always had the toughest matchups in the world he's gone against maybe some backup guys so there's some context there but he's got the size the power the anchor and just the the i think the intelligent intelligence to uh to, to win those drills and so he's been I think really stating a good a good case to be the number four running back on this team, maybe even over surpass and overtake Benny Snell as a number three. But Balaj has been solid, although he's never going to be, I think, a starter in this league. And then Jalen Samuels has been injured with, a, I think, a hamstring or some sort of left leg type of injury. He's only had one carry so far, so he's very much, uh, I think, outside looking in right now. Wide receiver, to be honest, there isn't a whole lot to talk about with that group, especially the starters. It's been kind of quiet overall. Chase Claypool's been a jump ball machine. They throw a red zone fade to him almost daily in that seven shot series. Him and Cam Sutton have had some really good battles. Sutton was winning those battles early. Claypool's won more recently. James Washington, for example, I think has only two catches for maybe 10 yards in team sessions this year. Not that I'm concerned or super alarmed by it, but it just kind of goes back to the idea of it's been kind of quiet. When it comes to the guys trying to fight for a roster spot or practice squad role, and you look at Rico Bussey, and he's a guy that was you know, kind of the talk of the town a couple of days ago in practice. I think it was Friday. The, the days kind of jumbled together at this point, but he's someone that's made some some big plays downfield and won some contested situations and just kind of got noticed for you know catching more than five-yard curls. And he leads a team right now with 106 yards. That's uh, the only receiver in, in Steelers camp who has triple-digit numbers and has you know had multiple plays of, I think, 20-plus yards downfield. Now, one was wide open in uh, that two-minute drill from Dwayne Haskins uh, early on in camp, but uh, still, you know, he's made some some tough plays down the sideline, and so that's going to get you noticed and get more reps. A couple other guys trying to fight for their role and, and state their case. I look at Tyler Simmons and Matthew Sexton. They're, you know, they're not making a whole lot of plays offensively. Simmons has one touchdown. Sexton had a nice 21-yard catch down the right sideline. I think the first day or two that we attended practice, but those are guys who will have to do well on special teams. And I think they have the ability to do well on teams. And Sexton, that was kind of his calling card at Eastern Michigan. And Simmons kind of has that thickly built frame and Tomlin praised him for uh, what he did as a gunner and and, and jammer um, in some of those sessions. So watch out for those guys when it comes to covering things like kicks and punts. Tight end group, Eric Ebron's missed the last three days with an elbow injury, but it's given a lot of guys that are youthful and need reps uh, a lot of those opportunities. And Pat Frymuth, I think, has been overall strong um, as a run blocker. He's taken his lumps occasionally against Alex Highsmith, but I think he's gotten better. He's shown finish and fight, and um, certainly he's in a better place blocking than a lot of rookie tight ends coming out of college. And these guys are just overall catching everything. I mean, there was a rough day on Saturday where there were a couple drops, one by Gentry, one by Kevin Rader. But overall, these guys are making some really difficult catches. Friar Muth had a great one, 19, 20 yards down the right sideline from Dobbs. Gentry has just kind of that above the rim mentality because he's 6'8 and just kind of a, a, a matchup issue. And so you've seen a lot of growth and improvement from him as a blocker is going to be the big question because you know, the positive with Jack Gentry is that he's 6'8 260. The negative is that he's 6'8", 260, or sometimes that, that height and that leverage can work against him. But I was watching a drill on Saturday. It was a tight end linebacker run blocking drill, and Gentry started pretty poor. He was popping up. He couldn't get leverage, and you saw him throughout that drill working with tight ends coach Alfredo Roberts get better, improve his leverage, improve his pad level, and his finish, and he had some good battles uh, by the end of the drill. So if he can keep his pads down, that's easier said than done, but if he can do that, um, then you'll see improvement as a blocker. And Raider, who had some really bad drop issues in 2019, led the team with five drops. That camp has caught everything except for one drop, but he's made some really difficult contested catches, and that's a guy that has the pedigree of a blocker and special teamer and if he can show hands a little bit, although he's a below average to poor athlete, um, you know, that could be a good battle between Gentry and Raider for that number three job. Along the offensive line, 
You know, there isn't a whole lot to talk about in the sense of trying to identify one guy. I mean, Kendrick Green has been available in practice every day, and that probably says a lot about the state of the offensive line right now. He's definitely shown some athleticism moving in space, had a great uh, open field block on Marcus Allen on a screen to Benny Snell, so that can hopefully be an asset for this team this year. But just overall, it's been a very thin group. They have 15 offensive linemen in camp, and uh, after Saturday's practice, only eight of them were practicing. You know, we had guys that were out or got injured during practice, like Anthony Coyle. So, I mean, there just aren't a lot of bodies right now. That is giving someone like a Rashad Coward a ton of reps, and he probably needs those reps, and that'll test and stress conditioning and things like that. But it's a lot of backups and guys that hopefully aren't playing a whole lot of snaps for the Steelers uh, this year. And hopefully sooner than later, some of these starters get back, whether you're talking about Kevin Dotson or Zach Banner or Chuck Wilmer for I believe Dotson is pretty close to coming back in team sessions. He was almost there uh, during the last practice, Banner and a core four, I don't know what their timetable is, but hopefully sooner than later, because this starting five is not taking a single rep together in camp so far. And individually and collectively, this group needs to be out there and get reps and uh, get some continuity and chemistry and make mistakes and learn from them. From them. So uh, the sooner the better for that front five. For the Steelers defensive line, it can admittedly be a little tough to watch those trench guys because in team drills, you know, they're all kind of in the middle of the action. The angle isn't the best, and so it is a little difficult to evaluate those guys individually. I would just say there's a strong amount of depth here. It's probably deeper along the defensive line on this roster than any other position, and so I think it's going to be a wire-to-wire battle for all those young guys to try to, you know, get those couple of final roster spots, whether you're talking about and Isaiah Laudemoke or Henry Mondo or Isaiah Bugs and, and Carlos Davis. Um, Bugs has seemed to run ahead of Carlos Davis so far, which is kind of interesting. Um, but all those guys are going to get a lot of playing time starting with Thursday's Hall of Fame game against Dallas. And so with Laudemoke and Mondo and, and Bugs and Davis, um, I really want to see that battle go end to end because one guy might start well but not finish well or vice versa. So who kind of is able to, to run through the tape and the finish line, I think it's going to be – uh, the guy or the guys that make their make this roster at linebacker Alex Highsmith has certainly grabbed headlines especially with the very start of camp for him and he definitely looks bigger and stronger and has still been a good pass rusher and is definitely um, not making it easy for this team to go with Melvin Ingram and I still think Highsmith will be the starter I mean there'll be a rotation there with him and Ingram and obviously Ingram can rotate with TJ Watt when he needs a breather as well but Highsmith has certainly taken I think a second year jump the only caveat to that is I'm waiting for Highsmith to beat someone who isn't a rookie. Every time we talk about some big play that Highsmith has made, and he's made a couple of them, it's been against a Pat Fryermuth or a Najee Harris or a Dan Moore Jr. And that's all well and good, and that's a win, and that's the guy you're facing, and nothing you can do about it. But I do want to see him beat somebody who isn't, you know, taking one of their first NFL practices, especially in pads. And so there is a little bit of context there, but been very happy with the job Alex Highsmith has done. Some other guys at linebacker who have been impressive. Jameer Jones has shown power and a good pass rusher plan and ability. And so that's a guy that I didn't know much about or really didn't you know, consider would be maybe a camp darling and, and have some, some buzz about him. But I've been impressed with him. He's number 44, so watch him in the Hall of Fame game. Cassius Marsh has been, I think, pretty good as well. Now he has an injury, missed uh, Saturday's practice with, I think, some sort of leg injury. So hopefully he's not out of the lineup too long. But I think he's at number four outside linebacker right now. Calvin Bundage, uh, undrafted rookie for region from Oklahoma State, is interesting. He's number 33. He's been an off-ball guy in Pittsburgh, but he can play on the edge. He can be an overhang defender, a good athlete with some good physicality. I think Marcus Allen has definitely looked more comfortable at inside linebacker in year two for him. Hasn't really changed his body type, I don't think. He looks like, like about the same guy, you know, size-wise, weight-wise, but um, I think he's taken on blocks better, and his coverage ability has been, I think, pretty solid as well. Moving on with a secondary and the star of camp, or one of the top stars of camp, has been James Pierre. He has two interceptions in team drills uh, over the last four practices. They've come each of the last two days, and both of them in seven shots. One was an underthrown fade from Rudolph. Another was that poor throw by Haskins that, that Pierre picked off. So he's making big plays, and I think for a corner in today's NFL, you want to create splash and create big plays and take the football away, and that's something that is drilled and coached by Terrell Austin, and I think Pierce may be able to carry that teaching over with his own natural talent and own natural instincts and and be able to make plays, and so he's been impressive so far, and if he keeps playing like this, they're going to have to find a way to get him on the field in some capacity. I mean, whether that's dime for sure, maybe even nickel where Sutton would kick to the slot, that's still, I I think, up in the air right now, but Pierre is really stating a case where he's got to be on the field to some extent. So I think in dime, I'm almost positive in dime, it's going to be Hayden and Pierre on the outside, 
And then Sutton in the slot with either Antoine Brooks or Arthur Merlette. Those guys have been rotating so far uh, throughout camp to try to, you know, see who's going to win that battle. And then, of course, Minka and Edmonds uh, as the steal of safety. So that'll be your 60 Bs there. So Pierre will certainly be on the field, probably as your right corner in dime. The question to me is in nickel, what happens? But Pierre has been really strong so far. One name to keep an eye on is Steven Denmark. He's been really impressive in camp, and I'm excited to watch him in the Hall of Fame game versus Dallas. He's a guy from Valdosta State that was a former receiver turned corner that is that height, weight, speed guy at, what is he, 6'1", 200 plus, who ran a 4'4", with really good length. And you see those receiver ball skills, ability to track and find the football and finish at the catch point. He's, he runs well. He ran with Matthew Sexton, who's a really speedy guy down the left sideline, I think in a 7-on-7 seven seven, uh, drill a couple days ago. And so he's a guy that I think could have a case to catch maybe that fifth quarterback spot. He's got to do well on special teams. Of course, that'll be his main uh, requirement should he make this roster and be active. But that's a guy that has some physical talent that is just very rare to find with ball skills and someone that I think will be playing a lot uh, this, this August. Justin Lane did have a breakup in Saturday's practice, but overall just haven't seen the big plays. He's gotten picked on a decent amount. And with Pierre making plays, and Denmark making plays, and, you know, just the whole group, generally speaking, the secondary have been that, that takeaway, that, that ball hawk mentality kind of guys. Uh, I haven't seen that from Lane. And so um, I think he's really in danger of, of, of missing the 53 and getting cut. It's not set in stone yet, and he's shown some value on special teams as a gunner throughout his career, but um, I think he's fighting for his life right now to stick around on the roster. And then with safety, it's a little hard to evaluate those guys because they're not always in the action. I've seen some some positive things from Trey Norwood. Um, he's shown, you know, what got him drafted, the instincts, the ball skills, taking chances, and has had one interception on, on Rudolph, and then during that same practice picked off uh, a, whoever the quarterback was in a receiver DB drill and had a great break and, and undercut a route by uh, receiver Isaiah McCoy. And so you see what got him drafted in terms of the instincts and being able to read and, 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 and diagnose things and drive on the football and, and finish. And so that's been impressive. And he could certainly um, make that case to be that probably number four, or number five safety. But overall, just to kind of give you the idea of how the teams have looked so far, the first, second, and third stringers, the starters, of course, have been Minka Fitzpatrick and Terrell Edmonds. The second string guys have been Miles Killebrew and Trey Norwood. And the third stringers have been Lamont Wade and Donovan Steiner. Quick note on the specialists as well. One really competitive day of punting so far with Jordan Barry and Presley Harvin. Harvin, when it comes together, has some really, really impressive punts. But as I've kind of noted with him, can he find the consistency? And I thought there was too much variance in that one session they had the other day. I thought Jordan Barry was slightly better. It was close, but I thought Barry overall was more consistent. But what those guys do in stadiums and not really what they do in camp is probably going to be the most important thing when the pressure is really on those guys. So that is my Steelers camp recap and update. I'm sure there's stuff that I missed. You can't talk about every single player so far, but if you want to stay informed about uh, what's going on at Steelers training camp, be sure to follow us on Steelers Depot. We have camp reports after every single practice. We have camp stats and a lot for you guys to um, digest. And hopefully you guys have been enjoying our camp coverage so far. If you have, be sure to like this video and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for listening and watching, and we'll talk to you soon.